Okay, um, I think we're going to get started. Hi guys, um, this is going to be a intimate session, I guess, on the um, end of the second day. Uh, I hope you're all ready to get a bit of a break from um, all the great technical talks that's been going on uh, at this year's NDC. While I'm here to talk about technology today, um, I'm not going to go into very underlying technical details. I'm going to focus on some of the consequences of the platforms that you've all probably seen have their breakthrough uh, in recent years. So hopefully uh, I can keep you somewhat entertained over the, last, over the next um, hour or so. Uh, and yes, I am aware that I'm what stands between you and, um, at least for some of you, a cold beer. But um, before we get started, if everyone could find your smartphones, your laptops, your iPad surfaces, whatever you use to access the internet when the speaker gets a bit boring, um, could you just flip it up and go to this address? Um, it's uh, slide.do slash NDC 2017, um, just to get a feel of the audience and also make sure that everything's working, uh, we've put up a poll there so you can select the alternative that uh, fits best with your current job. So let us just see here. One user. That worked. Okay. So it's, it's there. It's, it's working. Hey? Yeah, sure. So it's uh, slide.do slash NDC2017. Okay, so there's stuff happening there. That's great. So I'll um, come back to this at the end of the talk. Um, the idea is whenever you have a question uh, that you want to ask, you can just type it in here. And you can also see questions that uh, other people have, have put in, vote them up, vote them down and um, reply to them if you have. Okay, so uh, this talk is going to be about platforms, and it's going to be of what uh, I like to call the platform economy. Um, I'm guessing that pretty much everyone has seen this uh, quote from uh, TechCrunch in um, 2015. They, s they stated that uh, Uber, uh, the world's largest taxi company, owes no vehicles, that Facebook, the world's mo most popular media owner, creates no content, that Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory, and that our Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. And even though I, th I think this has been overused, there, there's something interesting that's happening there. It's impossible to ignore this seismic change in global economy. Uh, the largest companies in the world are no longer producers in the conventional sense. Instead, they've become distributors. There are complex networks that connect uh, demands with those who can fulfill those demands. So um, in this talk today, I'm going to start off by discussing some of the underlying assumptions that I think that all of us have, and uh, that's also been uh, the main story in the, in the mainstream media. Then I'll, I'll focus a bit on why uh, I feel that tech is really the enabler of the trends that we're seeing and not the characteristics of um, generations or, or such. And now in, in order to understand why these trends have such a potentially great effect on company structures, I'll share with you some research uh, into why companies exist and also why the platform revolution might threaten these companies, our companies. And towards the end, I'll um, see and, and discussing what, what this might mean for the future work, uh, for current firms out there, and also for, for society. Before I get started, just let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Jana Jonsson. I'm primarily a technologist but also an uh, economist wannabe. For the last 11 years, I've worked in the consultant industry in a great variety of roles. And for those of you who don't know me and haven't heard of me, which I suppose is most of you guys, um, I'm the kind of annoying guy in the industry. 
I'm the guy who blurbs out all the secrets and therefore is not particularly liked by management of different firms. And I suspect that this talk won't make them love me anymore. Um, currently, I'm head of two companies. One is called Blanc, and the other one is called Folk. Um, Blanc is a small consultancy firm. Uh, we started up about one and a half years ago, just wanted to test out some hypothesis on how to run a consultancy firm uh, in a bit of a different way. We're now around 30 people, and we started this subsidiary, which is called Folk, and that's our effort to try to bring the platform economy into the consultant industry. So it's a platform for vetted uh, independent IT consultants. Okay, enough about building my ethos. Um, while I'm sure that you would love for me to go into my background and, and really discuss my companies and get to know all the different details, we're here to talk about these new buzzword economies. They all go by different names, depending on who you talk to and what you're selling, but they're all merely iterations of the same. So whether you're Uber or Airbnb or TaskRabbit or the Norwegian Nabobil, you all represent a fundamental change in how work and services are sold and delivered. But first, what we all kind of think of when we think of the sharing economy, we think of, okay, who are these people who are using these platforms? The millennials. Who else? It's these urban, lazy, narcissistic, and entitled digital youngsters and selfie lovers. Uh, also known as Generation Y, uh, Digital Natives, Generation Me, Generation Rent, Echo Boomers, all born between 1982 and 2000. So I'm probably the oldest millennial out there, I'm born in March 1982, so I just made it. But uh, this generation is, is probably the most studied and, and talked about generation to this date. It's the first generation in history that's grown up totally immersed in a world full of technology. And this has shaped their identities. The, the hypothesis is that this has created lasting political, social, and culture, uh, cultural attitudes in millennials as well. And um, we're all surrounded by myths and mystique. And mainstream media also does this job very nicely. They love to paint the picture of the social, carefree, self-obsessed, meaning-seeking generation. Um, the millennials, they, they are supposed to lack a sense of loyalty. They are impatient. They hate the corporate silos and structures. And business consultants, both in Norway and also elsewhere in the world, they, they love to publish articles and reports on how you can understand the millennials or how you can recruit the best millennial heads. Um, and basically, the, the truth about these mysterious uh, variety of humans has been quite a hot commodity for, for use recent years. And there are others who, who like to, to add to this myth. Um, in Norway, we have something called uh, Innovation Norway. Um, and their leader, the head of Innovation Norway, uh, Anita Kron Kroset, um, she made a statement last year during a conference called Agdekonferansen. And what she stated was that uh, uh, what we're seeing out there with the sharing economy is a result of millennials, doesn't, they don't want to own anything. They don't want to own an apartment. They do not want a steady job. What they do is they prefer freedom. They prefer sharing. And they are the main fuel of the platform economy. So funny thing is, if you look closely, most of these things are myths. They're not the characteristics of the generation. In fact, if you, um, there's something called Pew Research in, in the US, and they just published um, a review of recently released government data in the US. And what they found was that millennial workers are just as likely to stick with their employers than their older counterparts in Generation X when Generation X were the young adults. 
So it's basically the same. In fact, among college-educated uh, millennials, they're more prone, they're more loyal than Generation X was when they were the same age. So one factor of this may maybe that millennials are more um, have a rev relatively higher level of education and higher level of education is typically associated with longer tenure at jobs uh, but these findings are more in, in accordance with my own conviction that the trends we're witnessing are more concerned about the advancement in technology and less with the habits the features the general characteristics of a generation and this has really fascinated me throughout this period, and, and that's why I, I wrote this talk in, in the first place. It's how much focus, at least in the mainstream media, that has been on the sharing aspect, and that these are uh, stuff about the generation, and how little focus this has been on the actual driver of these trends, the platform tech. In my opinion, the sharing economy, the platform economy, the, the gig economy, are all just consequences of that we now finally have the tools to find someone else besides the large existing actors in the market. It's the platforms who provide the infrastructure which makes it possible for you to share your car, share your ride, your apartment, or your tools. So that's, for me, the interesting part, and that is what I will focus on for the remainder of my talk today. If you think back, um, if you came to a city, uh, let's say, 30 years ago, and you needed to find a doctor or a shoemaker or a bank, how would you go about? You could just walk around, look for signs, maybe ask a local for help. But even though this was a task which required a lot of effort, the effort part of this it was, is what I will later uh, refer to as transaction costs. So that's something to, to uh, keep in mind. But um, at least we have the yellow pages. So they helped give, to give an overview of the different service providers as well as individuals. And for, you all know this, for over 100 years, uh, the telephone catalog, catalog was part of every Norwegian home. Um, tiny small uh, fun fact is that... Um, they were all white uh, up until 1984 when the Norwegian telco company decided to print them on yellow paper. So from that day forward, yellow, uh, the yellow pages has been a synonym for uh, the catalogs over companies and service professionals. Uh, but with the introduction of platforms, we simultaneously created what um, Jean-Charles Rochquet and uh, Jean Tirol called two-sided markets. And two-sided markets are roughly defined as markets in which one or several platforms enable interactions between end users. And they try to get two or multiple sides of a board on board by um, appropriately charging each side of, um, of the market. And by the way, uh, Jean Tirol, he also went on to, to win the Nobel Prize in economics in 2014, in part because of his research into these markets. Um, but what they found is that the platform market, the two-sided markets that, that we're looking at here, they're highly prone to what we call network effects. Network effects is, is simply meaning that it pays off to be a supplier or a buyer in a network where there's a lot of parties on the other side of the board. So in other words, the more users, they beget more users again, which is a dynamic which in turn uh, trigger a, a very self-enforcing cycle of growth. And the markets themselves become much more valuable as more users uh, start to use them. And um, this is a, a very, very uh, common effect in the platform economy. This is something that can be seen all over. And in some instances, this is also what causes uh, what you can see as the monopoly of the platforms. Um, 
And if you think of it, it makes perfect, perfect sense. If you have an apartment and you want to rent it out, you'll most probably use Airbnb because it has the most amount of people there instead of using a smaller, lesser known sharing site. Just because you threw Airbnb will get more traffic and you have more potential guests. And if you're a guest, you will probably also start on Airbnb because it has the most amount of objects. Uh, but when we talk about these platform economies, um, try to don't mistake them as just uh, these uh, sharing platforms. Uh, it's the same thing that drives Apple's App Store. It's the same principles. Uh, probably that's why Windows failed with, uh, or Microsoft failed with its Windows Phone, and why Alibaba is one of the most valuable companies in the world. It pays off to be in a market where there are many other parties on the other side of the board. So, um, Sanjit Chaudhry, he, he wrote a book which is called Platform Scale. And in this book, he, he wrote that um, platforms enable value creations and um, exchange by matching the most relevant resources from the producers in the ecosystems with the consumers on the platform that need those resources. So the platform itself is the central piece of infrastructure which enables these interactions between the end users. Uh, it consists of a technical infrastructures as well as a set of working processes, organizational incentives, which is supportive of the value-added processes that takes place in the interaction between users. Um, and all platforms has, has this kind of basic layer, right? So you have a, a basic layer of infrastructure that ha handles the basic functionality, creating a profile for your resource. So this profile might be a profile for your uh, people, for your car, for your house, or any other resource which is supposed to be traded on your platform. Um, but in addition to this, the layer, the, the um, infrastructure layer, needs more services. The platform needs services to make interactions easier, such as payment and also means of communication. And the infrastructure layer should handle all these different uh, transactions between the different parties of your platform. Now, the data of these transactions, they're used to develop a separate layer in the platform. Um, and this layer is used, of course, for the documentation that the transaction happened but what's interesting here is using the layer to analyze the platform services itself and help the potential customers find what they're looking for. So we all know uh, these type of collaborative filtering where you, uh, for instance, if you've used Amazon, you always get uh, good recommendations on, okay, if I bought this, other people who have a similar way of um, uh, purchasing history have bought these items. And this is one of the essential parts of platforms. And this is also why platforms help drive transaction costs down. It needs to mimic or improve on the corresponding human factors that would normally help buyers find service providers. I'm going to give you an example of this to, to make it easier. And, and please bear with me for a couple of minutes while I use uh, some part of, of my own company to, to use as an example here. But it, it illustrates how a platform needs to match the user's needs um, with the supplier's service. As I said, I, I've been in the consultancy industry since um, 2006. And uh, I've worked in sales since 2008. Normally, when we get a request from our customers, you receive a specification of what they're looking for. Uh, and this rings true both if, if there's a role requirement or if it's a project requirement. And when they're looking to staff a particular role, we usually get a wish list consisting of uh, maybe 20, 30 buzzwords that they want their candidates to, um, 
to uh, match, as well as uh, desired time frame on, on when the candidate should start. And as a salesman, um, I normally know that the customer rarely expect a candidate to meet all these requirements. I also know that they often value hands-on project experience uh, with the technologies more than certifications, and that they, for the right candidates, also might be willing to wait a bit. So here's the interface of the main page of the Folk platform that we're launching in August. Uh, now, if we, we did this kind of just straightforward, just in the, implemented a uh, search and filtering in a naive, naive way, the customer would always, often at least, find that no candidates match their list, and at least none who also are available in the time frame that they want to be. So what the matching technologies of this platform would need to do is to mimic my behavior as the salesman. It needs to help the customer do my job without me there, but also hopefully do it a lot better and more transparent. And this might mean always giving out results, even though you don't have the perfect hit, but always giving out results, but being transparent on how does this candidate fulfill your specification? It also will mean adjusting the ranking algorithms um, and boosting, for instance, project experiences, if this is what we, we feel is, is most important in the resume. And if we're smart making these uh, matching algorithms, we'll be storing searches, storing search results, and also storing the actual candidates that customers ended up contacting in order to feed these into a machine learning algorithm later on and thus turning, tuning the engine to become better than the salesman uh, or the saleswoman and thus making me basically obsolete. Now, when we come to actually presenting results, presenting objects, presenting candidates in this uh, instance, the presentation of these must be done in a credible way. And platform providers often simplify this process for themselves by building communities. So a platform you will try to build a community of people and community of providers so that experienced people can help guide newcomers, help build them their own profile. And as a platform provider, we need to build trust and confidence in the platform. We need to develop a platform culture, meaning that we share norms. We, uh, when we um, make a resume, we use the same words. We um, explain things in the same way. We have um, platform culture that can be seen as a parallel to the organizational culture that we usually have in organizations. And the platform culture will also help your platform grow by showing and promoting the desired values, the behavior in your network. One of the best ones at, at making this kind of platform culture is Airbnb. Uh, they can be seen as one of the most conscious ones in developing it. And several times they, they actually gathered uh, their most experienced, the most loyal hosts to their own conferences to help other hosts make their profiles. And um, one thing they said is, this is a global movement, and it's all about you. This was the motto of, of this guy here, uh, Chip Conley, who was Airbnb's hospitality guru. Um, Conley was recruited to Airbnb solely to develop the service quality and the plat platform culture. And he was recruited based on uh, his success as a hotel entrepreneur and also his several books on emotional marketing. So Conley made Airbnb be presented in mo more positive ways by appealing to renters, appealing to tenants and their emotional experience. And he did, did this by emphasizing a very honest and positive 
experience when the different actors interacted. Uh, and this also underlines the hypothesis that platforms are about more things than just technology. They are also about culture, network organizations, and complete ecosystems. And the last essential uh, thing of the platform, before we can see uh, how this affects organizations, is the concept of trust. This is the, also um, the last kind of essential part of the platform. If you think of it, in, in your normal day, traditionally you earn trust by learning that the people you deal with are rational, they're loyal, and you can expect them to deliver what they say they do, um, will, that, you, that they will deliver on their word. And when we do this in our normal um, work, when we rely on trust, we're lowering the transaction costs in the market because we don't need contracts. We can trust each other to do the stuff that we want to do. So trust can replace contracts, which in turn make the transaction, make the, the purchase cheaper. But on platforms, how can you trust one? The key thing is that the platform itself needs to earn trust. It needs to earn the trust from the different parties. It's the same way that a bank needs to earn trust from all of us in order for us to say, okay, take care of my money. I trust that you won't uh, do it harm even if you rent it out to someone else or borrow it out to someone else. Um, so when the platform does this, it, it acts as, as what we usually call the confidence man. Um, in other words, the kind of third party which mediates a transaction. And to gain such trust, there must be built-in trust mechanisms in your platform. Uh, this can be openness on transactions. This can be ratings, endorsements, user-made descriptions, and so forth. And you all know these um, different kind of, of trust management uh, from um, platforms such as uh, Apple App Store, Amazon, eBay, and so on. So up until now, most of the platforms that we've seen has been just that. It's been concentrated on sales of products, either physical products, products such as Amazon or Alibaba, but also virtual project products such as the Apple App Store, the um, um, sorry, Google's ah, never mind. Um, but what's changed in the recent years is that companies have started to use the platform economy to disrupt traditional service sectors. Airbnb has become a real nuisance for the hotel industry. And we've all heard of the effect that Uber has had on transport businesses. Um, I don't know if you're aware of TaskRabbit, but TaskRabbit in the U.S., uh, is helping people uh, to have help on um, different chores. You can, I need to paint a wall or I need to fix a sink or something. And the list of this is pretty much endless. And all these services, all these platforms is usually what we dub the gig economy. Small chores that happens and that we need people to uh, do for us. And the people here, are no longer employees. They're no longer hired by someone. They're considered as independent contractors, freelancers who are waiting for their next gig. Okay, fine. How will this affect your company, you might say? To figure that out, we have to go uh, disturbingly long back. We have to go back to uh, 1937, where um, quite famous economist, British economist, uh, called Ronald Coase, he wrote uh, this article here, uh, which has now become quite infamous, The Nature of the Firm. In this article, he answered the simple question of 
Why do companies exist? Because if you consider it, if all markets were completely efficient, the best thing would be for all transactions to happen directly between individuals. We would all be freelancers in this kind of perfect market economy. Companies would not exist, and no one would be employees. And the answer uh, that he discovered was these transaction costs that I've been talking about. What he realized is that there are what we call transaction costs that incur when you use the market. So in, this, in addition to a cost of the service that you're purchasing, for instance, if you're purchasing a graphical designer, in addition to the cost of that service, there are costs connecting to acquiring that service, getting the information, gaining trust, negotiating prices, negotiating contracts. In this article, he showed how by establishing a firm, you can reduce these costs. Or in other words, he showed how it would often be cheaper to have an employee, to have a graphical designer in-house, rather than having to negotiate every time a task needed to be done. And this was kind of a revolution. It still is. And the, the revolution in his argument was that um, a firm would emerge, exist, and continue to exist consist, uh, successfully if it performed its planning, its coordination, and its management function at the lower costs than if you use the market. Kind of makes sense. So they also had to be at a lower cost than if you had another company do the same things. And this is where competition come in. And this is why competition keeps firms internally efficient. This is also where the non-competition in some places of the public sector can create very complex, very non-efficient governance models and units that just outgrow themselves. Because you all probably know this, but managerial overheads increase as the organization grows. And whenever the transaction costs inside the organization reach the same level as the transaction costs in the market, market starts outperforming the firm. And when it outperforms the firm, that is when you usually outsource different parts of your organization. And as the corporation grows, if, if it doesn't adjust this and it doesn't um, try to trim away some of, of these things, the energy of the corporation will, will eventually just go into maintaining itself. And the existence of these high transaction costs outside of the firm, that is what led to firms as we know them today. That is why we have a group of people gathered in a firm with one common goal. And um, the world has just changed because what happens when the platform economy comes in? And what the platform has done, and that's the, what the platform economy has done and managed to do, is to dramatically reduce the transaction costs related to the market. So when you previously had to pick up your telephone book browse the market, try to figure out where, who are the different firms that I can call to, uh, who do I know, uh, what's the information there, and all these kind of things. The platform economy has uh, reduced the cost by simplifying enab and enabling interaction, coordination, communication, and trade between parties who neither know each other or trust each other. So that's the kind of brilliant thing about the platform economy. And while you in the 90s, you, if you were, um, I remember when, when I turned um, 18 in, um, in the, no, this was way before that. Um, this was when I turned 16. Uh, we went to, to London and we were, okay, where, where do we stay? So you, we went to one of the established hotel chains. 
and we booked a room. Uh, a room. And today, you don't do that. You go online, and you can find a luxury home in the Tuscan countryside, if you want to, or a couch in the Bronx. So using Airbnb and not the big hotel chains, they don't incur a higher transaction cost anymore. I don't have to call all these different farms in the Tuscan countryside in order to find something that suits me. It's actually adding value to me by not restricting me to the traditional uh, hotel districts or to the traditional hotel buildings. This is an illustration of San Francisco. And uh, as you probably already guessed, the green ones are the available hotel, hotel locations. And the red is the different types of accommodation that you can get on Airbnb. So when these two things happen at the same time on platforms, you dramatically reduce transaction costs and you have value-added service through using the platform, things will start to happen with your organization. Because from a purely organizational standpoint, these platforms will disrupt our traditional hierarchy organizations dramatically. As I just said, the reasons why we have companies where a lot of people are working together to reach this common goal, is that the company help reduce the transactional costs more than the market is able to do. But this is no longer the case. The platform will be taking over as a coordinating infrastructure for the organization. And what's funny about this is that in 1937, Coase already foresaw some of this. He stated in his article, and I'll quote him just directly, um, the transaction cost may be reduced, but it will not be eliminated by the emergence of specialists who sell the information. So he's, he's quite right. Platforms are just that, specialists who will sell you the information about the market. Well, what he didn't foresaw, and what we can now see, if, we, if you also consider that the platforms create network effects, where the value of the platform goes up as the number of actors increases, it will also increase your profits. And the reason why this is, is the costs of using the platform doesn't scale in the same way that the revenue from the platform does. So this means that the average cost of your transactions actually go down, which is the exact opposite that would happen in a traditional organization. And if the transaction costs of, of exchanging value in the society go down as drastically as it's happening today, the form and the logic of economic entities such as firms will need to change. So the traditional firm will be the more expensive way, the more expensive alternative almost by default. So if, if you think of this, um, because this will mean that a very, very different kind of management will be needed when coordination can be performed without people, just with the help of technology. Digital transparency will make responsive um, coordination possible. And, and that's the main difference between Uber and the traditional taxi service. The app can do what the management used to do. And my uh, hypothesis is that the platform economy will be, it's nothing less than an extinction, extinction level event. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the um, um, comment that was made was that uh, today Uber is losing a hell of a lot of money and is really subsidized by the investors. And that is true. And um, the, yeah, I have many theories on, on that, and this is also very much discussed. Um, what Uber is doing is really buying themselves the monopoly. 
and then by you buy the monopoly, they'll use that uh, to. Um, it's kind of a network effect that that they're hoping to use. That okay, for now you have uh, this taxi market that we're disrupting, and the taxi market is this big. Uh, but by introducing Uber and also introducing the price mechanism in Uber, will make more people use taxis. So the market expands to this. And when the market expands to this, we, we have these network effects that makes it more interesting and more valuable to become a part of it. So the next thing that they hope for is um, to, uh, let me see if I remember the, the kind of order correctly. Next thing they're hoping is that um, the rental market of cars will kind of just go away because now it's cheaper to just use Uber instead. And when they've uh, conquered the kind of rental market, what they're hoping then is that the leasing market will go and so on and so forth. So what they're betting on by, by using this kind of huge amount of money is to change the entire transport sector, even though they know now these days is in much trouble and is losing money uh, in an unimaginable way. But that's the kind of their big game plan. Uh, so it's using the platform and also taking advantage of the network effects that they hope will, will kind of dribble on over, over time. I don't know if that's an adequate response or... Yeah, yeah, I agree. So um, yeah, the point is that um, you can't just conclude that uh, everything will work the way Uber worked because Uber is losing a lot of money, and I, I do agree with that. Um, but it's more of the example in itself that, that you can see that uh, Uber, Uber runs a, an enormously big company using apps and using the platform as a coordination infrastructure instead of using middle managers which is what usually everyone else does. Um, but I, I, I appreciate your point, at least. Um, but what, what I think we'll see is that very, very small firms, because we ha now have this platform that enables us to kind of uh, have a different market, a, a different service market that we see emerging, very small firms can do things that in the past required very, very large organizations. And if you run a company, if you run a company today, consider the fact that you now can have on-demand business talent available to you for very short-term contracts. So you can save money on benefits, on office space, on training, and it will be cheaper than using existing companies, such as the consultancy firm that I had myself, because these freelancers that are using these platforms, they don't have the same overhead costs that the traditional firms have. They don't need to pay people like me to find them projects. They don't need the fancy offices. They don't need the support staff and so on and so forth. So, and that often means that you as a company can, can hire in higher skilled people to help you when you really need them. And of course, this is not just a black and white uh, conversation because a lot of critics will, will claim that the company structures is not all about reducing transaction costs. It's kind of uh, offensive to say that all your company does is reduce uh, transaction costs and that's the only uh, reason why it exists. There are other value increasing parts of your company. You have culture, you have a community, you have a sense of meaning. And what often people say is that this is, not, this is not something that the open market can cater. And why, while I agree with them, and I think this is something that we as, as leaders of companies need to consider when we're structuring our, our organizations for the future of work, because on the other side, the platform economy in itself, social media, uh, the effective co cooperation and coordination tools such as Slack or Trello, they help maintain a culture. They help drive a community, and they also keep a sense of meaning in a company-free world. And for the people who I think 
make up the most of uh, the audience today. If you don't own your own company, why should you have a boss? As I think most of you also already know, uh, the IT industry, both globally but definitely here in Norway, is currently booming. The, all of you guys are individuals in high demand. And by becoming independent and thus a part of the platform economy, you will get a lot more of the profit. In, in Norway, an independent consultant usually makes double of what everyone else does. They make double of what I do. And while this is so, Financial Times wrote a, a very interesting article um, about six months ago, and it made an interesting argument for the entrepreneur side of things. And uh, what they wrote in their piece on, on the independent worker was that um, young people especially are currently working as independent consultants while they try to start their own company. And as much as 39% of independents consider starting their own business is their most likely next move. So what do we actually know about the future? Um, I will lean on, on some um, research done by McKinsey and Financial Times in this. So McKinsey did a, a survey where they had 8,000 respondents in the US, the UK, Germany, Sweden, France, and Spain. And what they found what, was that currently the independent workforce is um, around 20 to 30 percent of the working age population in the United States and the EU countries. But um, what they found was the independent workforce was very diverse in terms of age, in terms of income levels, education, gender, and that was also across countries. So being your own boss clearly cuts across borders in all occupations, all industries, and in other words, not just a thing for millennials. Um, they had these four uh, different kinds of um, segments where they had these uh, independent workers. Uh, to, very simply, it's, it, it, do you do this as your primary uh, income or just as a supplement? And is this because you want to do it, it's your preferred choice, or is it because you have to do it? And um, the data so showed that uh, the casual earners, so the people on the top right side here, they are the, um, definitely the, the largest segment in all uh, six countries, uh, followed by the free agents. And these two groups are around 75% of the independent earners. One of the interesting things that we found, uh, that McKinsey found in their uh, research was that the independent people who chose to be independent are generally more satisfied all the way on the board than traditional workers, almost in every dimension, like the overall work life. And for me, more, more surprisingly, also on income security. So on income security, they're just as satisfied. They don't uh, have the worries that you might suspect when you compare them to traditional workers. They score just as good. Okay, but what, what, where do we go from here? What, what can we expect? Um, what can be expected is it's estimated that at least 14, 14 more percent of the people who now are tra in traditional jobs will wish to become independent primary owners. They say that they're inclined to pursue such a um, career. And the paradox of it is even the, when you look at the media coverage that's been, even you, when you look at my presentation where I say, oh, the platform economy is great, it's going to revolutionize everything, digital platforms is almost not found. Only 6% of the independent people have used, who provide labor, that is, has used the platform. 
6%. 94% use other ways of finding work. Um, I'll leave you with that. And even though your company is not willing to change with these kind of new realities that I think are coming, you can be sure that some of your competitors, some of your partners will try to benefit from the scale. Some will try to keep their core operation focused on what they do best and then call in independent service providers when they need them. Um, this can be, uh, if, if you think of it, this, can, um, this flexibility can allow organizations to just add a new entity, a new capability, by calling in, for instance, writers and designers, do this one-time marketing thing, or as one of the sponsors of, of this conference, I'm not going to tell you who, but one of the sponsors, uh, they've done exactly this. They, they've opened up a new department just by hiring a lot of independent consultants which make up an entire department in their uh, structure. And as we've seen, um, taxi and the hotel industries always felt this competition. Uh, I think it's likely that we'll see this in other industry. And my own industry, uh, I think, is uh, one of these. It's, one, it's going to happen quite quickly. And um, I'll just walk you very, very briefly through, through the consultancy here in Norway um, and, and why this will happen. I don't know if you know Clayton Christensen, but he wrote in, in 2013, he's a, he's a business uh, professor at Harvard Business School. He, he wrote an article where he said the consultancy industry is on the brink of disruption. And the key drivers for this is disruption is the democratization of knowledge, um, an increasingly sophisticated client side, and the rise of alternative professional service firms, such as Eden McCollum and the Business Talent Group. And what these firms do is that they assemble project teams for their clients using freelance consultants. So you have mid-level and senior alumni from the top consultancy going freelance and, and uh, making a partnership with Business Talent Group. And Business Talent Group will, will set these people together in a project team and then offer them in competition uh, with the traditional firms. And, of course, this will be at a lower cost because, again, the freelance consultants doesn't have the same costs and, as all the rest of us. And this has already happened in Norway. Um, we can see in the IT consultancy industry that uh, the client side has become increasingly more sophisticated. It's become mature. And along with agile methodologies, it has shifted the way that companies source in their consultancy needs. Most of the clients in the Norwegian market, they source people one by one. They take responsibility for the project themselves, and then they source in roles. Uh, and my best bet is that around 70 to 75 percent of all the sales in the consultancy industry in Norway is already happening with this uh, type of, of sale that you, you're sourcing in people one by one and doing body shopping, even though all the firms are very clever at, at uh, hiding this. And this has done um, things on the independent side. So the independent side of, of the Norwegian IT consultancy market has grown rapidly. And you can see the broker side of, of the market has grown to now almost um, half a billion Norwegian kroners in just a few years. So everything is kind of set for a disruption of our market. Uh, and I think it will happen uh, pretty soon. And when it happens, uh, my guess is that a lot of companies, including my own, will need to change, and fast. Okay, I will try to wrap it up. Um, as you've probably gotten a sense of, I believe for the most people here in the audience, um, the specialized one, the highly skilled one, I think that the platform economy will probably be f good for us. It will work to our advantage. Um, and as McKinsey's study showed, most of the people who to choose to be independent are um, mostly very happy and happier than the traditional worker. And when the entire industry, like now, is, is dying for you to join them, you can shop around. You can be a part of the elite. And um, even in the platform economy, you don't have to trade away your security. 
uh, you have the ability to, to set the terms in a, a completely different way than another. But the flip side of it will be that I think it's quite possible that a full-fledged platform economy will create a two-tier uh, labor market. And we, we have already seen tendencies of this in Spain, where uh, low-income households, they make up 40% of the independent uh, workers in Spain. And among young people, two-thirds of the working uh, young people in Spain are working as independents and on very, very short contracts. So this is kind of the lost generation of, of uh, Spain and will be very troublesome in, in years to come. To sum it up, um, three key takeaways. Uh, and I always know it's been a long talk. One, the sharing economy, the gig economy, and so forth, it is not driven by character traits. It's not give, driven by uh, one generation, but it's driven by two-sided markets run on a digital platform, enabled by digital platforms. Number two, by dramatically reducing transaction costs and adding network value, uh, the platforms threaten to disrupt the traditional uh, hierarchical organization. And three, independents by choice are more satisfied with their work life than traditional workers, and they are believed to grow in the coming years. Okay, I'll see if we got any questions. Um, I'll take the first one. I run a consultancy company. Do you think the consultancy company will exist in five years? Um, I do but I think it needs to change and needs to be driven. I think the consultancy firms needs to provide something that you can't get as an independent consultant. You have to take more risks. You have to um, accept lower margins. You have to be willing to do stuff and, and that you can't do as an independent. And if we're able to do that, then I think we'll exist. But if we're not able to, to do that, if we just continue as we do today, five years, maybe, 10 years, no way. Consultancy firms driven as they are today, just uh, focusing on having 25% margins, giving back to the industrial owners um, when we have the platform company coming, no way, it won't happen. It, I don't think they'll exist. Um, the next one, how do teams fit into the perfect market of freelancers? Uh, and that is a good question, but um, here I think I'll just have to, to um, refer to the two companies that I mentioned. So it's Eden McCollum and the Business Talent Group, and they do this exact thing. They have their vetted uh, freelancers, and when they get uh, project proposals or um, um, team requirements or something like that, they look through their free freelancers and they set... Uh, they put together the team that they think will be the best one for this particular project, and then they offer that to their customers. Uh, and that's how I think the teams will fit into to the freelancers, um, or team of freelancers will, will fit in. Okay, any other questions or? No, okay, thank you. <laughs>